Hey everyone, welcome to Food Talk Live. A reminder that this episode will also appear on Food Tank's podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg, and you can subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, today I get to chat with Mike Curtin, the Chief Executive Officer of DC Central Kitchen uh, based in Was Washington, DC. I I'm probably one of Mike's biggest fans. Um, and before I introduce him, I hope that all of you who are watching and listening will go to dccentralkitchen.org and find ways to help. This is an organization that's incredible. Um, Mike joined uh, DC Central Kitchen in 2004 as the chief operating officer um, and really expanded the organization's social venture portfolio. Um, he supervised the launch of DC Central Kitchen's nutrition lab facility, expanded, expanded their catering program, and increased the organization's overall investment in local farm products in 20, uh, 2007, sorry, uh, Mike became the CEO, CEO of DC Central Kitchen, and he has been a really amazing advocate for access to healthy food and a really good friend to Food Tank. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Mike. Uh, before we, we start, I just want to make sure that you and your family and your colleagues are staying safe and healthy during this crazy time. Well, thank you, Danny. And uh... You know, an introduction like that is just what you need at times like this. That was, that was very kind and, and uh, you know, very humbling. Uh, we, we are. We're doing our best. Um, you know, I, I was just, I just came back from the kitchen. Uh, I've been going in every day to be there with the team. I think that's really important. Uh, most of our work are the workforce that can are working remotely, but we have our production teams in three production facilities working every day to make sure that food is getting out into the city in places that needs it. Yeah, um, so. absolutely. We're, we're, oh. we're working hard to, to keep safe. Good. We need you. So please continue nice. to stay safe. And again, the website for DC Central Kitchen is dccentralkitchen.org. I want people to know more about this organization. I want you to donate if you can. I know it's a tough time for everyone, but there are also ways to volunteer. And I'll keep giving out that website throughout this episode. Thank you. So, Mike, when we first connected last week about you being on the show, you were talking about the really the increase uh, in, in demand at, at feeding sites. And I'm sure that has only worsened since, since last week. Can you talk about what's happening uh, in the city right now and, and how, many, how many people you're seeing at some of the sites that uh, DC Central Kitchen has? Sure. Uh, well, in the, the first week of this response, which was the week starting March 12th, uh, I'm sorry, March 15th, I guess, um, we put 36,000 emergency meals into the community um, this week, our last week, we did 43. Wow. Um, so, and we have no reason to believe that that is going, that, that, that well, we believe, have every reason to believe that trend is going to continue. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we've seen really at, at, at several of the remote feeding sites that we are, are, are servicing now uh, throughout the city is, is there's, uh, we, we believe there's two things that are happening. One, there's an increased demand just because as time goes on, but also we're seeing this is the end of the month. Uh, right. And as SNAP dollars run short, people are looking for more places to to see to find food. And now that we've been doing this for going on three weeks, people are more aware, and and we're seeing that come out. We've also, at the request of the city, opened up two new sites at schools where we um, right. one where we serve food to every day when schools in session, another one that we don't. Um, and we're um, we've added a. a one, a couple other feeding sites. One, interestingly, is uh, in an area where there are several senior apartments and many of the adults in these apartment complexes are grandparents taking care of grandchildren. Wow. So two wow. sort of at-risk groups in, ter in terms of food insecurity just within our basic everyday food system. Uh, and so we've been asked to do more in those areas to, to specifically target those folks, folks to make sure that they're getting the food nutrition they need during this time. That's so great. I was also reading about the healthy corners distribution efforts that you're doing at 50, more than 50, I guess, corner stores. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, one of the, the healthy corners program is, is something we cooked up. You mentioned the, the nutrition lab that we opened. Uh, and when we did that in 2011, that gave us the, the infrastructure to, in essence, become a wholesaler of fresh fruits and vegetables, and especially value added cut fruits and vegetables, healthy products, granola, whole grains, two corner stores in the foodie, city's food deserts. Um, so we've expanded that over the years um, with 
you know, various marketing efforts, working with the local Department of Health, with mm -hmm. the USDA, through the Food Nutrition um, and Security Nutrition Initiative. Um, and I've seen that growth uh, just be exponential over the years. Uh, what we've done over the last month is reduce the cost by 50% of whole for whole vegetables and 25% mm -hmm. to whole fruits to corner stores to get more of this food out in the market. Uh, last week, um, over the last two weeks, we've sold 12,000 units of wow. uh, product in these corner stores. Um, uh, so again, uh, just trying, as we always do, but even more so now, trying to have more outlets throughout the food system for fresh, healthy food um, throughout the city. Sure. And for some of our viewers and listeners who might not understand what a food desert is, it's, you know, you know, they're also called food swamps. It's places where there's not a lot of uh, access to healthy food. But what does exist is like your corner store, your bodega, a liquor store. And what DC Central Kitchen has, has done with these um, healthy corner stores is get more healthy food available for purchase. And it's an amazing program. I mean, I think it's, it's such a lifeline to communities now more, more than ever, Mike. So yeah. I, I'm so glad you, you were able to cook that up in, uh, in the nutrition lab. <laughs> well, thank you. That, that was something that Robert Eggert, our founder, and I had talked about mm -hmm. for years. And we were really hoping, because there, there'd been so much study, so much work, so much energy put into this notion of food deserts, which I'm sure many of your, your listeners are, are, uh, are familiar with the, the term that, uh, some people are saying food desert is not really appropriate. Desert being something that's naturally occurring is part of our ecosystem. It actually makes the whole system work. And it, sure. while maybe inhospitable, ultimately it's good and serves a purpose. Food deserts exist because of, of uh, systemic uh, exclusion and more business and economic reasons, racist, you know, uh, sort of racism, for sy sure. yeah. systemic racism and inequality. Um, so the, the food deserts by many activists have been referred to as food apartheid. Um, I will say uh, of one of the, the, what I hope desperately um, will be one of the many silver linings that comes out of this very dark cloud is, is a different relationship people have with their food. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, we have undervalued, devalued, misvalued food in this country so tragically uh, and so unknowingly for, for decades. Um, th that has really created some of the system that we in, in Food Tank and, and all of your members have been trying so hard to undo or to redo over the years. Um, and people do talk about food deserts rather blithely, um, but mm. you know, it's, it's a hard concept for people to grasp. Uh, right. I, I, live, I live right outside DC in Northern Virginia and, and in my neighborhood, I can walk, I can walk to three huge full service grocery stores. And if I want to mm -hmm. drive a mile, I can get to two more. And they're talking about now building another 50,000 square foot Whole Foods in that same geographic area. Wow. Um, and, and half of our city is serviced by, Washington DC is serviced by a fraction of what's available in this little t suburb of 10,000 people, uh, right, which is, right. is, is criminal. Right. So I, I think now people, when they go into these stores and don't see food and they can't just get what they want at any time, at any day, at any right. season, uh, very, very inexpensively. I, I really hope that people are going to start to realize that, th th that we can't take this food for granted forever. Uh, and, Absolutely. and I hope there's just a greater awareness that will uh, serve to elevate the work that we're doing and the work that is again so many of the food tank members and and, uh, and folks in this orbit are doing so that's one of the things that i'm, I'm hopeful for no I, I am too and it, you're not the first expert we've interviewed on, on this live cast to say that raj patel has said that you know a lot of other folks um who you know live and breathe the food and agriculture world but i i also think it's interesting that you use the word criminal because i i think it's been we've we've been you know, wasting food and not valuing food and not valuing farmers and not valuing the people who, uh, you know, process and, and, and distribute and, and serve our food. And I, I think, you know, this is a, a real time to understand that, you know, that those were huge mistakes. And some of it is, you know, um, because of the things you mentioned before, systemic racism, um, socioeconomic, you know, sort of um, uh, racism, people have just not valued 
food or people. And it's really time to end that. So yeah. um, DC Central Kitchen, again, uh, the website is dccentralkitchen.org. Please go there, learn more about them and, and please donate. Um, Mike, I know you're, you're also ramping up production um, at, at some of the shelters in DC because they're remaining open during all day during this time. Am I right? They're, they're not sending folks out. Correct. Uh, yes. You know, and so you have to increase production of meals to serve the, the homeless population in DC, which I imagine will also continue to grow during this time. Uh, it, 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 we, we, we are definitely seeing that. Uh, and actually a couple of smaller, but new shelters have opened. Uh, today we learned uh, for the first time, unfortunately, because this happened a, a little bit ago, that there have been people diagnosed with the virus within some of the shelters. Uh, so this is obviously going to create a tremendous problem. Again, uh, forcing people, uh, all of us, to rethink a little bit about shelters and what that means mm -hmm. and prisons and what that means. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, and, and not only are we increasing the production, but we've also had to completely retool our production methods for years, 31, actually, um, all of the meals that we've served, whether they've been in schools or shelters or to other social service organizations, nonprofits, have been communal, family-style meals where people would go through a line, sort of the old cafeteria style. Mm -hmm. um, we've been asked and, and, and certainly mm -hmm. want to do uh, the best we can by all the folks that we're feeding to serve these meals, to package everything individually. So that is uh, like literally redoing our assembly line and production yeah. facility. We, we redid it in 36 hours. Um, yeah. And we, so it's, it's, it's not just a matter of like buying to go boxes and then doing that. Right. And as anyone, anyone who's ever worked in food service understands that there's, there's a production methodology or any kind of production for that matter sure. uh, you know there's now not a lot of talk about assembly lines and, and ventilators and redoing assembly lines it's I, I don't want to make you know be too flippant but it's the same thing in essence is that we're redoing how we do things it takes more staff that's it's the labor is more intensive it's certainly a lot more costly not only from mm -hmm. labor's perspective but from a supplies perspective it takes more space it's takes more space to deliver more more uh staff time to deliver more vehicles so it, it's this exponential ramping up of, right. of 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 our system which again you know has been it's and again you talk about another silver, silver lining it's been just wonderful um to see our staff to see what they've done and, and to see as i as i've said in some of the things i've sent out to our supporters there's been no hanging of heads there's been no wringing of hands there's been no asking why they're just said sure. this is the job and, uh, and, and this is what we do. Um, but I will say it's, it's been very different. Um, we've always mm -hmm. liked to have that, that plucky little can-do attitude that we say that we want to be, right. sort of the, you know, Keith Richards, Hunter S. Thompson's, <laughs> your pants, rock and roll kind of organization. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, that, that charges into the problem. You know, when there was a blizzard, when there was a hurricane, when there's tornadoes, 9-11, we never closed and, and we yeah. just kept doing more and more and more. And there was an excitement and an energy about that. And part of it was we knew that was finite, you know, snow, sure. it was going to stop snowing. The snow sure. was going to melt. Um, this, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, and that's sort of the, the X factor. And, and it's also a little more lonely. You know, when we had those blizzards, it, w w one of the things that was just amazing to see Danny was folks who lived in the neighborhood just like literally pour in to the kitchen to help us do wow. our meals. Now, right. three, three and a half weeks ago, we closed the doors to volunteers. We just said, yeah. it was one of the hardest decisions we've ever had to make. Um, and it, and it still is a hard thing because people, they want so desperately to be part of this. And we mm -hmm. just, it's just not a smart thing. They can't be. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's, so it's, it's isolating, you know, when we were, when the blizzard, everyone was together and it was crazy cool. Uh, but this is, this is very different. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, uh, food tank, well, you know, some of the things we do, we bring people together and, and, you know, we're trying to do that in a different way right now, but it is, it's very isolating. And I, you know, I, I know so much of, of your, your mission is really to use, food as this tool to really build communities and, and again, bring people together. How do we do that in, in this time of, of yeah. physical distancing? How do we keep being social, but you know, remain physically apart? 
Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's sort of the million dollar question, isn't it? You know, it, it what we what we do know, and this is the beauty, uh, I think, of the kitchen, and this has always been what the what the kitchen has been about, is that uh, food creates communities. Food brings people together like nothing else. You know, every everyone has a food story. It doesn't matter where you grew up, what your story is, what your history is, what your family is, what your background right. is. You have a food story, and and you can understand someone else's food story, and and you come together around that table, um, yeah, and, and celebrate that that which makes us human, that which makes us family, that which makes us community. You go back to, uh, you know, when, when I was before I was doing fortunate enough to be at DC Central Kitchen, I was in the restaurant business. And you've probably heard me say that when I, I owned my restaurant, that was my, my first experience in the nonprofit sector. Uh, but, but part of that experience when I was developing that plan, I very consciously wanted to make that restaurant the center of the community. And, and I mm -hmm. wanted it to sort of harken back to the tavern in colonial days where people right. came. This is where you got your news. This is where you checked on your neighbors. This is when you found out who, whose cows were sick or when was the next right. house raising. And, and that, that's that been sort of that arc through our culture and every other culture up to and including Cheers. You know, one of the most popular sitcoms <laughs> ever was based on that idea that this is this brings us together, that place of yeah. hospitality. Uh, and, and so I do hope that um, that, as I was saying earlier, that, that because of this crisis, this, this tragedy, that we do get to have a better, a better relationship with our food and have a greater awareness of how that does build community and what that means. So coming out on the yeah. other side, that's going to be really important. I think what's fascinating, too, is, is, is how we, we are just learning to meet differently, uh, virtually. You know, mm -hmm. as, as we're doing now, and uh, and I just have to to say this, and I was I was texting sort of jokingly, I think on Friday night with um, my good friend and uh, compadre and food fighter and mentor Robert Egger, who's now out in New Mexico, who who founded DC Central Kitchen, and one of the things he talked about years ago, years ago, he was talking about this this looming crisis of seniors who are going to be hungry. You know, we we're, yeah. we do a great job, and we need to do a great job about focusing on our our youth, our kids, the yeah. children can't, but, but to, to imply that there's one hunger is okay. And another is bad is, is something that really puts us in an awkward position if we want to end hunger or right. fight hunger. And, and Robert was really concerned about seniors in isolation. And he was talking about, wouldn't it be great if we could set up this system where people would, we, we could, you could order a meal and send someone a meal. And then when they get it, you, you there's a, you know, an, an email address in there or, or something that you could actually sit on your phone and talk to that person and share that right. meal. And I was like, right. Robert, come on, man. No one will ever do that. That's, that's crazy. Uh, which people said when he started DC Central Kitchen. Uh, but this is happening now. And I think this yeah. is, this is fabulous. I think that people uh, are reaching out to family members and, and sharing dinner on FaceTime or Zoom that yeah. wouldn't have thought about calling someone for a month before. And right. now all of a sudden right. we have to do it every week. So I think that that's, you know, again, the, these, are, these are silver linings that are coming out, come out of this tragedy, but, but having that greater relationship with food and understanding how important that human contact is, whether it's through a screen or right next to each other, I hope, I hope we don't lose that. I, I agree. And I think, you know, we're all, you know, realizing that how much we appreciated food and appreciated restaurants and appreciated eating with our friends. And, you know, I've had uh, the, the great pleasure of, you know, connecting with friends over Zoom and, and you know, FaceTime and, and sharing drinks and, you know, eating food and, and talking and laughing with people. I don't get to see that often. So I, th I think yeah. we can all find ways to find that community um, uh, back in, you know, include it back in our lives and, and know that someday, even though with the uncertainty of all this, well, you know, humans are, are very, um, uh, clever. We, we will figure out how to get through this crisis and, and, you know, we'll, we'll be back to, to eating together sometime soon. I, I hope, but I, I think one of the things that I've appreciated about reading, um, what DC central kitchen has been doing over the last three weeks or so is that, you're not only providing sort of um, nutritional support or, you know, providing support to communities, you're also really thinking about your staff and sort of this moral support. Can you tell um, us what you've been suggesting, you know, people who are fans of DC Central Kitchen do um, by uh, sending notes to your staff? Well, yeah, yeah. well, one of, the, one of the things we, 
we've always tried to do this. Now, it, you know, it's interesting now there's, there's a greater focus on it, which is always how, you know, often how things happen. Uh, but uh, we've been, we, we are incredibly fortunate to be so supported by the community in the greater Washington DC area and, and around the country and around the world, quite frankly. Um, and uh, we've been getting over these last few weeks, some incredible feedback from funders, local politicians, uh, supporters, and we've made a um, real effort to share this with the in, entire team. Um, we've been, we, we created actually uh, in the fall, uh, we have about 170 full-time employees now. Um, and uh, uh, we, we finally got to the point of doing the email or the text chain with every, everyone. So those, there's a, about half of our staff work in, in, in a kitchen production facility and, or role. And then there are others who work in a more traditional desk kind of administrative role. And so there's the, those with computers and those without, and always wanting to bridge the gap and make sure there are no def, diff, those kind of significant differentiations between our staff. Sure. We've created this, this text chain opportunity. And so we've been texting on a daily basis, these sort of affirmations, if you will, um, that are going out because I said, as I said, uh, you know, th this is isolating. We, we, one yeah. of the things we always had 365 days a year for 31 years, we had volunteers in that kitchen, 16,000 a year. And so there's always an opportunity for someone to say to someone, hey, great job, thanks, give them yeah. a smile, say hello. And without that, it's, it's a big, big difference. Um, so, so we've been doing that. We've, we've also been uh, intentionally re focusing or, or making sure we're not forgetting the folks that are working remotely. Well, there's been mm -hmm. a ton of attention and rightly so paid to the production and delivery team because that was so immediate and, and, and so visceral and they're there, you know, they're coming to work every single day, which a lot of Americans uh, aren't again, wisely. Um, and there, so I think it would be pretty easy to say, well, those people at home, you know, don't worry about that. We could, but, but working at home, that could be isolating as well. You know, it Absolutely. sounds good, right? <laughs> but after a while, like, eh, maybe not as much. And, right. and we're, we're an organization that has always thrived on uh, collaborative work and, and, and sharing of ideas and the give and take. And that's, that's always been important to us and, and certainly to me, and that's been my style. Uh, and so we, we want to make sure that we're reaching out and, and we are using these technologies instead of just conference calls. Like, you know, I, I'm really, I want to outlaw conference calls and say people have to use this kind of right, you're right. seeing someone and there is a little bit of a difference there. There is more of a touch, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, you're at least you're, you're forced to pay a little bit more attention, maybe, um, right. which, which, I, which I think is important. Um, you can't wear your pajamas. You have to get dressed. <laughs> or, or at least halfway. You know, one of the things <laughs> right. that I love that I've heard that that uh, Walmart is, is seen an uptick in, in shirt sales, but not so much in pants. You know, right. Beautiful. Now that's got to make everyone wonder. But yeah, we're just going to keep playing it right here. But um, but yeah, Dan, don't move anything. Um, but uh, but 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 so so, so I, I think there's there's just a, an awareness too of uh, of not just like hey you're, we're getting the food out, but are you okay? You know, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I have to say when I was driving in Monday morning, which was the first day after the mayor, uh, the D D D.C. Maryland Virginia mayors and governors put out the stay at home notice. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time you're out on the street, really, obviously traffic had been markedly different, but this was the first time it, there, was, there, there was a big difference, right? It, and yeah. it was just, it was more of an emotional mental thing. I don't think there was the number of cars were probably about the same, yeah. but there was just an idea, you know, and it was eerie. Right. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think this can create, and we have to be honest about it, an incredible amount of anxiety um, right. and, and, and worry. Uh, and you know, everyone's got their own, it's not only work, it's their families. And like you said, you're living with your, your, or someone that living with your mother or, or, and, or they're, you know, an elderly parent, a young child, there's so much going on. Um, so we're, we're and, and we're really, uh, on a regular basis, keep putting out, um, tools provided through our EAP, uh, insurance program, as well as our insurance provider. Um, who has, as part of their app, has daily, um, I don't want to say daily affirmations, but uh, sure. coping mechanisms, um, you know, quick uh, emotional health tools and checks. Um, and so, and, and again, you know, health insurance for us has always been a big deal. And, and we, we pay 100% of everyone's health insurance. Uh, and, and we just wanted, you know, never quite, I'd love to say that we had this in mind, but we didn't. Uh, but yeah. we always knew that that was an, an important 
part of not just a job, but, but a career and someone's real, you know, life work balance. Absolutely. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm really happy that we have that in place now and we can take advantage of these uh, tools that, that they're offering now. And, and um, you know, and just, just another way to keep us all, keep our heads in the game and make sure we're, we, we're where we need to be. Yeah. Again, for anyone who's been to DC Central Kitchen as a volunteer, I, I mean, you see how hard the staff works and, and they deserve all, you know, all of our support. So, you know, um, I, I'm just going to keep pumping the, the website, uh, Mike. It's dccentralkitchen.org. I don't think Mike would say this, but I think now it's more important than ever to donate if you have the means um, and, and the ability to do so. dccentralkitchen.org. We really need to help the folks who are who are it's so in need right now and, and, and help the staff as well. Um, Mike, I know, you know, in fact, the last time I saw you was on, on, on the Hill, on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. over the summer. And I know you're so involved in, in the policy side of this. What, what should lawmakers be doing that they haven't done? I mean, we have the stimulus bill, the CARES Act, but w what else needs to be done by policymakers during this time? Well, I think what we're seeing, one of the things that we're seeing and we will continue to see, is how fragile and how taut this vaunted safety net of ours really is. Uh, and I think that, you know, the 10 to 12% of the US budget, the discretionary spending part, the part that isn't military or what's referred to as in like maddeningly so it just drives me crazy as entitlements with it medicare social security i, I sure. pay for that so i don't feel i feel i'm right. owed that not entitled <laughs> um but all of these things that we do to to make ourselves the nation we want to be um but there's this this other bit this other this more flexible part of the social safety net snap um that that uh is just a, a punching bag in a political football uh, and it, it, no one takes it seriously. And there's, there's, there's fights about tax breaks. There's fights about bikes, about social security. There's fights about um, uh, defense spending, but we, we really, I hope the politicians really focus on what this, this safety net and what food insecurity, uh, daycare, access to daycare, healthcare, mental health care really means to the economic security of our country. Absolutely. Uh, you know, this is, this is an argument we've been trying to make for years. Uh, it's a national security issue. It's, it it's really a national is. security issue. And it's an, it's an economic security issue, right? We have poverty. You know, we've been saying this for years and people laugh. Like, poverty is expensive, right? It is hard to be poor. You know, it, it, is, an, it, it is draining. Uh, and no one wants that. And, and I, I just hope that there's somehow a shifting of this, this poisonous mindset that we've had as a, some have had as a country for so long that if someone's poor, it's their own fault. If right. they're hungry, they're lazy. If, right. if they're not working, it's because they, they don't want a job. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's so hard to see people continually talk like that and, and never be forced into a place where you, you have to confront it. And I think now we're all having to confront things in a way that we've never in a lifetime, two well, lifetime and a half, two lifetimes have, have had to confront something like this. So I, I really hope that the politician's memory grows a little bit, expands right. a little bit. And we right. see that a lot of what we're seeing now, totally avoidable, totally Absolutely. avoidable. Yeah. And what would you suggest for folks who are watching? Should they call their Congress people? What should they do? How can they make you know this this not happen again? How can they not only um, remind uh, policymakers to have more empathy, but to also take action? Well, I, I think I think absolutely. Well, being aware of votes like farm bill votes and and attempted uh, cuts to SNAP. Um, and, be, and paying attention to those and paying attention to groups like Food Tank and to Tom Colicchio's group who are, who are grading politicians on their votes regarding food security and, and mm -hmm. food access and food equity issues and voting on that. I mean, again, one of the things we do not do well as a country, which is also criminal, is vote. But we need to vote and we need to see what, who, who, who reacted to this uh, crisis appropriately, right, um, right. who took advantage of this crisis, uh, 
who will be then proposing legislation to prevent things like this from happening again or saying, look, what I saw, what I saw, the, the America that I saw, I don't want to see, I don't want to be that America. Right, and, right. And, if, and if there are politicians that are saying that, get them the hell out. I mean, th that is what we have to do. We have an incredible power as citizens in this country to vote and, it, and we just do not use that tool. So please vote. Uh I couldn't agree more. I think that's such a great note to end on too. Mike, you, you're a true pleasure and a true hero in the food system. A reminder that this episode will be available on our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. You can find out more about Mike and DC Central Kitchen at foodtank.com. And again, please donate at dccentralkitchen.org. They need your help. Please donate. Um, thank you so much, Mike. Um, I, I I treasure you. Um, a reminder that we will be back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Fatima uh, Sumar of Oxfam America. Everyone stay Bye. well. And, and again, please donate to DC Central Kitchen. Stay Bye. well. Stay peaceful. Take care, Danny. Bye. You too. Stay peaceful. Thanks.